A very good evening to one and all. Thank you for joining us at the third talk of Think Again Live, a virtual guest lecture series brought to you by Apogee, the annual technical extravaganza of Bits Pilani. To get you to experience thoughts, innovations, and deep dives of knowledge right from the comfort of your homes. It's a common saying that every great design begins with an even better story. And today we are here to listen to the one written by the pioneer designer of the world's most recognizable logo. As a generation that grew up with the internet, our predominant introduction to the World Wide Web was through the primary use of the brilliantly colored Google logo. When this tech giant was still in its initial stages, the arduous task of designing the Google logo, which was just beginning to expand its wings, was handed to an art professor from Stanford. Born in Brazil, an architect from Israel went on to design something that, that later came to impact everyone's life on the globe. We are indeed glad to have that very same personality of honor, our highly accomplished guest, Ruth Kedar. In our topic for today, it's not just a logo, it's the entire saga, the Google logo story. We'll walk into the intricacies of what went in the design thinking of the famous six letters, G-O-O-G-N-E. And how does design makes this world a better and a beautiful place to live in? Welcome, Ruth, and thank you so much for joining us in this conversation today. Oh, so, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so without any further ado, let's dive straight into our discussion. So Ruth, tell us how has life been for you? How was your childhood, education, and what propelled you from an architecture degree in Israel to studying design at Stanford and eventually teaching there? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a circuitous uh, route. So I was, uh, as you said, I was uh, born in Brazil. And uh, as uh, a little girl, actually, I, uh, I started, I think my first foreign language uh, was French. I was at fourth grade. And uh, I actually wanted to be the Brazilian ambassador of, uh, uh, in France. And uh, but somehow that did not uh, pan out. And uh, living in Brazil, which is a very multicultural place, I was always very interested in uh, the different languages, the different customs, the different cultures, and how they uh, interacted. My mother was a uh, mathematics uh, professor, but she was also a painter. Uh, we lived for a while in a small uh, town that the majority of the population was Japanese and getting to understand uh, that culture. And I always was uh, fascinated by the fact uh, we have my cat here with me uh, help, helping out. Um, so we, I was really fascinated by this idea that there were always uh, different ways of communicating. There were a lot of different miscommunications happening. And every time uh, we needed to solve a particular uh, problem, uh, it would come into some sort of a, uh, a kind of a standstill. And uh, so from, from very early age, I was really interested in uh, language and in communications, uh, but also very, very interested in, uh, you know, again, mathematics and technology on one side, art on the other side, and languages. So those three things um, really, really tied in together. And the more I thought about it, um, uh, I thought as I was going through high school and then my family moved to Israel, I had to kind of start uh, from scratch there, that if there was something that would kind of combine all of those things together and still solve very specific problems uh, for people uh, was architecture. So for me, architecture was the field that combined all of those things. It had both uh, sciences, technology, it had uh, the aesthetics, the art, but also a very, very utilitarian, which uh, in the end is what design is. Design is this very utilitarian discipline that is there not just to create aesthetics, but it's there to really solve problems. And one of the things that I became more and more and more interested as I was going through 
uh, school, my five years at the Israeli Institute of Technology and the architecture school, is there was a huge disconnect between what architects were creating and what uh, the users were actually um, experiencing. So this is way before user experience was a term. But architects were enamored with forms. They would do cross sections that unless you are Superman and you have X-ray vision, you can not see. Or they were doing bird's eye views that unless you have wings and you can fly over buildings, you can't see. And in many ways, humans for most of the architects and my peers at the time were just um, scales for their models, right? So you put little humans on their models so you know the scale, but it was not really designed for humans. And I experienced this, I went to airports and I couldn't find my way to where my uh, luggage was and I didn't know where the gate was and God forbid I need to go in an office building and find the restroom. And so I started thinking about ways in which you can, in some ways, translate these very human problems from an architectural scale into a human scale. So I started getting really interested in uh, what it was then called uh, architectural graphics, right? Creating signage and symbolic uh, informational systems so we could translate these amazing buildings that were created into the real pragmatic and practical human scale, right? So that humans could really enjoy this. So um, uh, as I finished architectural school and I was really interested in this, then was the time to look for jobs, right? So um, I went to architectural firms and I said, you know, this is what I'm interested in. I really want to create these systems. And they said, I'm sorry, uh, we don't do those things. This is not kind of part of uh, what we are interested in. So I went to graphic design firms and they looked at my resume, which it was still a very, very short resume. And they say, you are overqualified. We don't hire architects in our design firms. And so uh, what I decided to do is since I couldn't um, be hired by an architectural firm because they were not interested in this and they were not interested in doing this or had no uh, ability uh, to do this in the design world, then I decided to actually start my own firm and uh, to be the hub between those two sides. And I started doing uh, these uh, big projects uh, where actually I was working with both uh, the users then and the architects on the other side and really trying to create these informational uh, systems for architecture. I did that for about five years. And I had this sense very much that I was uh, doing something that I had no training because I really was doing this uh, as I was going along. I was kind of inventing these things. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Baron of Munchausen, but I'm not talking about the lying part, but the part that there is uh, this image that uh, he tells these fantastic stories and he was shot out of a cannon and he drops into the ocean and he lifts himself by his own ponytail. And I felt like this, that I was constantly lifting myself by my own ponytail. And I felt that after five years of doing this, I really needed to go back to school. I really needed to get mentorship. I wanted to be in a place that uh, was interdisciplinary. And so I had two choices. Um, I had MIT and Stanford. Both of them had uh, interdisciplinary programs at the time. And California won because it's much nicer weather. And I, um, I was accepted at Stanford. And my idea uh, and my uh, letter of intent was to actually continue doing and diving into architectural systems, uh, informational systems for architecture. And when I came to Stanford, which was a wonderful experience, 
I uh, took every design class that I could, uh, both the ones that were given on the art side. Uh, so these were more visual design and I took classes on uh, the product design side of things. I took uh, human design or human uh, kind of interaction, which was just, just nascent field classes. And so I took as many as I could and uh, when it came time to do a master thesis uh, at Stanford, there is no PhD program. It's an FA, uh, MFA program that you need to do a master thesis. And when it came to do my master thesis, I thought this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue working with informational uh, signage and ended up doing a project on playing cards. So my whole master thesis uh, was on playing cards, which um, was really interesting project. We can get onto it maybe a little bit later. But um, after I created uh, these, uh, these decks and went on a very, very uh, deep exploration, uh, one of my conversations with my professors at the time was, um, you have to understand I was a little bit older than my counterparts because I had already worked in the field and I was coming this at a later, later stage. And I said to my professors that I have already uh, worked with budgets, uh, worked with uh, timelines. I had projects that needed to be completed at a certain time and I had a uh, series of constraints. I wanted to use this year for exploration and uh, I knew that at the end I was expected to have a product because this was a interdisciplinary program between the art department and product design. But I told them to allow me to fail. Uh, I wanted to explore and dive into this whole field of, um, of playing card design, which is uh, quite uh, extensive, has been going around for almost a thousand years. And uh, if there is a product in the end, great. If there isn't, feel free to fail me. And uh, I am incredibly grateful to them that they were able to support me in doing that. And they allowed me to explore for a year. And at the end of that year, I had three products. So uh, it ended well. So at the end of my uh, uh, study time at Stanford, uh, I still felt very much like I have uh, a lot to learn and a lot to um, explore before I can call myself a professional. And they surprised me by asking me to stay and actually start teaching in the program that I had just finish. So uh, it was a great honor and one of the scariest moments of my life um, because now I had to pretend that I knew something that I could pass on to other people. Uh, and that's how the story goes. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, it does. And that was quite an interesting journey you had. So Ruth, it's been 22 years since Google was first launched and we all know the giant it is today. But we understand when you first started working on those colorful letters, it was just a small venture started up by two kids out of college. From there to Google becoming, a, becoming an Oxford Dictionary word, verb today, can you tell us the story of how it all started for you? So uh, I was actually uh, referred uh, to uh, Larry and uh, Sergey by a fellow um, uh, a friend and uh, a fellow Stanford uh, who was doing his uh, PhD program and uh, knew Larry and Sergey from the uh, on the Center of uh, Design Research at uh, Stanford, um, and uh, he referred me to them. And one day I received an email from Larry asking me if I would be interested in meet and talk to them about this new venture. Uh, they had just left Stanford and were starting up. And we had, uh, so I met uh, with both of them. And as you said, it was a very, very small uh, company at the time. I believe there were uh, five people. And uh, we started having conversations. And at that time, they were exploring 
uh, not just uh, conversations with me, but conversations with other designers as well. And I think that the kinds of conversations that we had, the kind of explorations, the questions that I was asking, um, the ideas that were being kind of just uh, explored, uh, kind of picked their interest, and they asked me to come up with some ideas. And that's how the process started. And very much <clears throat> in the way, I mean, it's interesting to uh, look back uh, today and we know the gigantic um, enterprise and how ubiquitous uh, Google has become, right? So it's really hard to imagine what Google was uh, when it was such a small company. But I think that what's really interesting from a designer point of view is that the way that you approach the conversation, uh, the way that you try to understand what are the problems that you're trying to solve, uh, what are the uh, ideas that need to be uh, more cooked and kind of uh, more deeply looked into, um, what are the thoughts that haven't yet quite coalesced. All of those things are conversations that you have because if you're trying to create, in this case, a brand, or we're not even talking about branding then because it didn't exist in, <clears throat> in the way that we speak today. But if you're really talking about <clears throat> one a particular mark or logo for a company, this is kind of the most distilled um, image that you can create that somehow behind it needs to have all of the big ideas that the founders, the people that make up the company, the landscape at the time, who the users are, all of those things need to be right there behind it um, in a way that it can serve the company in this moment to solve whatever problems they have. So in the case of Google is trying to explain how different they were uh, from every company out there, not just from the companies who were doing search at the time, uh, which were more like the yellow pages, which is, uh, you know, it's uh, all about uh, marketing companies and kind of putting them in front of you. And the Google algorithm was very different than that, but also how they view themselves so different than every other company out there. And the idea that they had that this company was going to be really, really different with a different culture. And that was really important to them. So you're trying to solve for those problems because these are the problems of today. But hopefully, if you really get the essence of who these people are, even though you were talking to them today and maybe even their ideas for what the future is going to be is, uh, and their imagination perhaps is limited somewhat. But if you manage to capture that, then it's going to stay with you and it's going to serve the company as it grows. So one of the things that I like to think looking back at the success of the Google logo specifically, is that it started with a company of five people who had ideas and dreams and aspirations and an imagination. And it managed to serve it for 15 years when Google then was hundreds of thousands of employees. It was all over the world, perhaps at that time, still not in the Ox Oxford uh, dictionary, but definitely it was a verb and everybody knew what Google was. Um, so being able to create something that serves a company while it grows so exponentially, and it's not just one service, but so many different services, actually speaks to the importance of what I call design thinking, which is a little bit different than uh, what design thinking is uh, today understood in the industrial design concept, but design thinking in the sense that it is my job as a designer to come in and be a catalyst um, 
of all of these different uh, disciplines and aspects that make a company or that make a brand or that can uh, solve a very complex problem, right? And so uh, that is kind of the history of how I started at Google and how kind of Google took off and in many ways created this uh, symbiosis between the Google brand and the Google logo to the point where for many years, <clears throat> if you said the word Google, those letters came to your mind, right? It was kind of impossible to kind of disconnect the two. And I think that that's something that uh, we all aim to create is this kind of real synergy between all of the elements that represent a brand and the brand itself. That was really very fascinating to hear. And following up with the same question, uh, what perception did you have of Google as an idea after Larry Page first dropped you an email, which was followed by your first meeting with him and Sergey? Did you ever think it would become something the entire planet would depend on? No, and I think they didn't either. Uh, although I think that one of my first impressions of both of them is that uh, they were uh, fearless, right? They had this idea, they had this belief that they created something that was extraordinary. Uh, and they created something that was unique and that did not exist. They were uh, thinkers, creators, uh, thinking out of the box. I think it's uh, impossible to be in the presence of people who are so uh, passionate about what they do and not be kind of uh, swept into uh, and kind of kind of you you become taller uh you don't know me i am quite short but in meetings like this i feel like i am a little bit taller uh and uh i also think bigger and um i think that i was really impressed by what it is that they were trying to do and that is really the important part is that you get passionate about it's contagious right so you start listening and the more you listen, the more questions you have, the more questions you have, the more um, conversations, the deeper the conversations are, you get to know them better. So I had no idea where this is going to go, primarily because you can have a fantastic idea. You can be, a, a, as I said, a thinker and passionate and creative and all of that. And circumstances can be such that it doesn't go anywhere. I've been, I've worked with companies that again, had brilliant ideas and brilliant people working with them. And for one reason or another, it did not go where it needed to be or where they wanted it to be. So I think it's impossible to look at something that is nascent and say, this is going to have such a trajectory and this is where they are going to end up. Uh, you, as, as I said before, can have an idea that something has tremendous potential. And here was something that had tremendous potential. Uh, but you have to understand that at that time, Google was being introduced primarily to uh, uh, university students because they were at the time the ones that were the more versed with the new technology, right? People were afraid of using computers at the time because, you know, they were afraid that they press a button and the whole thing is going to explode. I mean, for those of you who are old enough and had Macintoshes at the time, you know, when it uh, when it died on you, it had a little bomb, right? So you had this, <laughs> you had this feeling always that, you know, at any minute, the thing is going to disappear, everything you wrote is gone. Uh, you know, we were really at this cusp of technology. And so their um, client base was a very specific one, right? But in many ways, it feels like when you're talking about building infrastructure and you're talking about 
uh, really changing, making a big change, and you're thinking long term, you start with education, right? You start with the children and you allow them to kind of grow with a certain amount of education so they can do something perhaps a little bit later on. And that was the idea. We were going to start with university students and we'll see where it goes. And they were right on because that's how it started and started with word of mouth. And little by little, <clears throat> people realized that they were really getting something that was incredibly useful and they were not getting this anywhere else. So to answer your question after 15 minutes that I've been talking is no, we didn't know where this was going, but all the signs were there that if, if the stars aligned, that this could go very far. Uh, Ma'am, seeing Google as it is now, it's difficult to imagine it in its initial stages like that. So thank you so much for that glimpse. Uh, moving on to our next question, uh, back in the 1990s, when digital product design was still in its very nascent stages, uh, what was the inspiration behind the first cut of what the world knows as the marquee Google logo? What was the logic behind the font and the impactful colors chosen? Right. So going back to uh, what I was saying before, uh, the fact that uh, both Larry and Sergey saw themselves as being uh, very different than all of the, co the companies out there, uh, both in terms of how they approached uh, company building uh, and, um, and culture and how they wanted to uh, kind of market this and approach uh, not only what this company was going to be, but also, so not what is in front of the users, but everything that it's behind the scenes in terms of how they uh, develop uh, this product and uh, the ingenuity and the mathematics uh, that were uh, behind the algorithm. And we talked a lot about that. And one of the things that you, you need to remember is that uh, the the big companies uh, at that time were uh, all about showing um, kind of a sense of trust and a sense of stability. And they are, um, you know, you can trust on the, on the fact that they're monolithic and they don't move fast. So you have this sense that you can trust in them because everything is going to stay the same. Right. So if you bought any uh, appliances for a company, you know that they're going to stay the same. And so you can have maintenance and you know that you have somebody you can call to. But that's very different from a company that's actually really breaking the mold and it's really interested in innovation. So the first thing was we wanted to create a, a, a logo that represented that. The other thing, as I said before, people were really uh, afraid of uh, working with computers. So this whole idea of, of play, of being a child, right, of, of having this idea that um, you have curiosity, you because search is about curiosity. You're trying to find something. You're trying to look for something. You're trying to learn something new. You're trying to solve a problem. So you're kind of looking to forward uh, to find the solution or to find something that did not exist in your own world, right? That's very similar with play. Play is all about curiosity and discovery. So that seemed to fit really well. Now, the other thing about search is that it is in many ways, a search result for me is the place where past and future meet, right? You're looking for something that already exists <clears throat> or that existed before because it's already there. And you're trying to look at that and you're trying to find that so that you can solve today a problem that it's going to be uh, used and applied in the future, right? So you're talking about this place, this very, very unique place where past and future meet. So when it started, when I started thinking about uh, fonts, 
I started thinking about the history of um, of uh, letter forms and um, and alphabets and uh, the whole technology. And one of the things that's really interesting is that the way that letters have been developed, uh, the uh, have a lot to do with the tools we used, right? So if we go to ancient Greece, or if you want to. <clears throat> the Phoenicians that use chisel on tablets or chisel on um, on marble, uh, you have what today we see as serifs. We still have that, right? Because it comes from those instruments. Later on, as we started writing on papyrus, we have paper and they started having something that resembles ink. And later on, uh, we have the quill and we can start having cursive. Then the alphabet changes a little bit. Things become more tied in together. Letters are no longer separate. Uh, you have different ways uh, in which you express these letter forms. And I thought, well, if we're now looking into this new technology that is going to be primarily viewed online, and at that time there were a lot of problems with um, resolution, right? We were not we were not at the time that we are here today. So uh, having fonts that pixelated and uh, got impossible to read when they were very small. So I thought that one of the uh, really nice things about serifs, and we use that a lot still in, uh, in printed books, is that it makes it easier to read. So I thought, okay, I'm going to look back into some of those serif fonts, but I really also want to look forward into something that's modern and... Um, hasn't been used before. And I ended up finding this font, um, Catol, that uh, had really interesting uh, characteristics. Now, I'm gonna put that aside for a little bit. Another thing to be talked about when we create a logo that is based on a company's name, is you look at the letter forms that make, you said at the very beginning of this, uh, of this talk, uh, the letters G O O, lowercase G, or it could have been uppercase, but G O O G L E, right? So looking at these letters, when you look at a font, you want to look at the font that allows you to create a logo type, which is all of these letters together, that is very unique. So the G on Katul, the lowercase G and the uppercase G were very, very unique. And also those thick and thins uh, of the letter forms were very unique. And I modified them a little bit to actually make it even more unique uh, to Google. And um, that was uh, the idea behind the fonts as, a, as of colors going back to play. Now play is uh, going back to really early childhood, you start thinking about primary colors. Primary colors are fascinating, not just because uh, they are um, incredibly bright and uh, children are very drawn to them, but also because you start looking at how primary colors are the foundation upon which every color uh, is created. Right. So again, if you think about Google as being this uh, search and this algorithm, it is the foundation. Those bits, those uh, ones and zeros are the foundation upon which everything is found. Right. So again, you start seeing how these abstract ideas and seemingly unconnected ideas all come together to create something that then makes sense much more than putting a magnifying glass or a target on a, a symbol um, to signify that this is a search engine, right? So you end up with something that's very abstract and it captures the essence of everything that our conversations um, uh, kind of covered. And in that sense goes back to the fact that by doing that, abstracting that to the essence, understanding all of these elements that were brought into it, allowed it to be still current 15 years later, when those 15 years were really a huge leap, not only of what it is that 
Google was doing, but what technology had become and what the um, the tools in the hands of people uh, have become. So it was a completely different world and it was still serving uh, that world for that long. Uh, thank you so much. Ruth. Now, every time we look at that Google logo, we'll know that they aren't just some random colors. <laughs> right. So since the so uh, the, moving on to the next question uh, since the first cut we have heard that it took four versions before finalizing the logo that went on the to be famous google.com so can you briefly run us through the journey of these transitions right so this goes back to what i was saying that you don't want to create something that is uh, obvious and I think, uh, I'm not sure that there were only four iterations. I think that there might be four kind of uh, floating around in the interwebs these days, but uh, there were more. There were uh, one of the things that I really like to do uh, because when you're talking about translating complex ideas into a visual imagery, uh, I look at this visual imagery as also being almost like another language, right? So you're translating uh, these complex things into another language and how can you do that so that is um, understandable and people kind of get it and it's memorable and all of those great things. So uh, in, in that sense, for me, it's really important every time I have a conversation with a client and it's the same thing with Google as it is with big companies today or small companies today that I deal with, uh, it doesn't really matter, is that every single time I have a conversation, I go away, I come to my studio, I have brainstorms, I come up with things that hopefully will allow for the conversation to be deeper. Because very much like uh, Alice in Wonderland who says, I need to see what I say to know what I think. Sometimes you need to see something to say, oh, that's not what I'm thinking. I uh, actually, let me reformulate what I'm thinking, right? Or you look at something and you say, oh, I haven't thought about this before, but this really fits. Right. And so then we can go back and do another iteration and another iteration. So there were iterations at the very beginning that were a little bit more literal, right, in which we had elements that were a little bit more literal. And although they um, they some of the people right in the room, we had five people in the room or something like that. And some of them uh, really like this aspect and some of them really like the other aspect. But I think that it became clearer and clearer as we kept going that we wanted to make this really abstract, that we wanted to keep the name completely clear of anything else. Uh, we actually didn't even want to add something to the name that would become kind of a, a an icon or a symbol on, on itself that the the name itself needed to represent everything. So uh, that's kind of the process that we went uh, we went through. Um, it was a fairly quick process by uh, by today's standards, actually, but it doesn't mean that there were not a lot of conversations and back and forth to actually come to the thing that we agreed on, including, you know, the. Uh, uh, the order of the letters, right? So we started with primary colors, but then we I wanted to introduce a, a secondary color in there. So it's not just, you know, red, blue, and uh, yellow. And the idea was, well, when you have colors and you have the color wheel and they come in a certain sequence, right? It's the way that you expect. That's how they are when uh, a prism uh, is broken, light is broken into all the different colors. There is an order. Um, but there is a serendipitous uh, aspect of how results uh, are shown, uh, right? Because before you had online search, uh, how do you go search? Uh, you go to a library and maybe you have an encyclopedia and it's done alphabetically, 
right? Uh, or it is uh, thematically, right? Um, but one of the great things about going into an encyclopedia is that if you go to, let's say, the letter P, you might have parrot just next to politics, right? And so parrot doesn't have anything to do with politics unless it's a political parrot, but it's together because of the letter P. Well, same thing with search results. There is something in which there is an unexpected, right? There might be something in there that was totally unexpected. And so let's break the rule one more time, since Google is all about breaking the rules and not keep these letters uh, and those colors in their um, usual progression. So that's how all of that came about. Oh, that's uh, very intriguing and must have taken some time, especially 20 years back. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From the first time you saw your Google logo that went on the World Wide Web to now when you see it every day and it has become an identity of one of the most viewed sites on the planet, your life must have changed a lot. So what were the major impacts that you felt in your personal and professional life? Well, actually, in, in some ways, uh, it, it's not what uh, you expect. And I think... Uh, it's important perhaps to uh, tell a little bit about that because so when I uh, did the, the logo for Google, and again, Google was very small, there was no immediate impact whatsoever. I continued to teach at Stanford and I continue to have other clients uh, privately in my practice and life continued very much the way uh, it was before. Um, and then after a few years, uh, actually, uh, my marriage kind of uh, broke down and I uh, needed to um, really look for something that was um, kind of more um, perhaps uh, profitable and uh, in order to actually, uh, you know, pay the bills and things like that. And so again, I started looking uh, for design companies. And even though at that time, I had, um, uh, you know, my resume had uh, a few things in there. Again, graphic design companies were thinking that I was overqualified. Uh, one thing that I was also doing at this time was um, uh, together with a couple of other fellow uh, Stanford uh, professors and PhDs, we were creating a new company that um, was in many ways the first kind of uh, social platform uh, for education. And we were creating this uh, forum for education that was being tested at Stanford. And I was then, I called myself the chief guru, I don't know, uh, of uh, customer experience. Uh, we all had kind of cool, groovy uh, titles then. But my job was really to create all of the user interface and we were really starting um, uh, to plan to to um, to actually code and uh, create this environment and i was doing this while i was looking for uh you know paying gigs and i was overqualified because again they saw the things that i was doing particularly since i've been teaching at stanford for a very long time and so it was really difficult uh, to find to find the job, and at that time, uh, the internet was just starting in terms of um, commerce on the internet, and I decided that that was a really interesting. Uh, interesting field because it was very different than the things I was doing. The things I was doing were perhaps a little bit elitist. I had some of my designs in museum shops and I had, again, thought and uh, I really was interested in designing for maybe a much larger public. And so I started looking for these companies, which were very small at the time. And I got a job as a programmer at a, a company that was doing internet commerce very, very much at the beginning. And it was fascinating because I started again, completely different field from scratch. I did a lot of coding and I learned this new language and this new field that was just being started. 
Uh, and then uh, that company became very successful and it grew and it continued to grow. And with that, my knowledge and the way that I was kind of moving along in the company and what it is that I was doing. And I started becoming a lot more involved in the marketing side of things uh, and in the user experience side of things. And again, at that time, it was not that coined and it was not that um, perhaps uh, structured, right? We were all learning as we were, we were doing. And um, I continue working in this field and from one company to another. And uh, all of these companies were uh, internet companies uh, doing commerce of different kinds and uh, providing different services. But I became creative director uh, for these companies and uh, responsible for everything on the marketing side of things, primarily while being consulting on the um, user experience on the other side, right? And um, as I was uh, as I was doing this during this time, it became the tenth anniversary of Google. By that time, Google was a big deal, and everybody uh, started writing articles about Google and becoming really interested in all of the aspects of Google and their journey. And I was part of that journey. And so I started getting requests for interviews from, uh, again, first uh, American press. Uh, but then after that, um, presses from all of the countries that I, from where I was born, so Brazilian press, from perhaps where my parents were born, so Latin American press, then uh, Polish press, because my mother was from Poland, uh, to Israeli press. So suddenly the whole world was interested in that. And that's where I would say kind of my notoriety uh, occurred because it was 10 years into that, that people were coming to me people I've worked with for years and they're going like, what, you designed the Google logo? And they were so impressed by it. And I would say, I'm the same person you saw yesterday, right? We had coffee together, that makes no difference. A lot of this great thing that's happening now, it's because of the success of Google and perhaps the success of the logo in this trajectory. But uh, until that point, nobody was that interested in it. Right. And after that, of course, there's always been interest uh, in people wanting to know the, the story, although, you know, my career has uh, changed and I've been doing other things and there have been other projects, although not as as known uh, as Google is. But I don't think that it has changed in many ways. And I. Um, I'm very grateful for that because it required me actually to go into different areas uh, to become really humble uh, because I had to start from scratch, right? And I had to learn new things, which That's today exactly. allow me to be that. able to also solve a lot more problems that I could solve before because I, you know, have worked with a lot of engineers and I have worked with a lot of uh, people uh, in these industries that usually designers, quote unquote, are exposed to, right? And I think that it's incredibly important uh, to be able to communicate and to deal with and to listen to and to take into account that their problems are as important sometimes as the CEO problems. Right. And we need to solve that because otherwise uh, in down the line, the consumer or perhaps the investor or perhaps um, the partners or the affiliates or whoever uh, is not going to get the service that they want to get. That's quite an interesting life you have led. So, <laughs> so Ruth, you also designed Adobe Deck on Adobe Illustrator which became a factor in paving the way to it becoming a go-to software for designers today. Can you tell us how this project came to be? Right. So I mentioned that my master thesis was on playing cards. And uh, one of my professors uh, at the time 
my my mentors at the time for that thesis was uh, David Kelly, who is the founder of uh, IDEO and now the D School of Design at Stanford. Excuse me, and uh, he wanted to connect me with. Um, uh, with uh, Chuck Gecki and um, and John Warnock at Adobe, which was a very very uh, very beginning stages, they were developing PostScript. One of the reasons why he wanted to connect me with them is because I had during this one year project, I have been pushing the envelope on printing uh, on dot matrix uh, printers at the time, because I created all of all of the decks, uh, the products that I had at the end were actually decks that you could play. But I was really print, uh, pushing um, both the software at the time that was available, which was, you know, Mac paint and uh, full paint or something like that, all pixelated. And, um, and and he really wanted me to talk to them about this new technology uh, PostScript because he said they were just developing this new software illustrator uh, that was really difficult. It all was based on busy acres and it had a lot of geekiness behind it and designers didn't want to have anything to do with that. So I went to meet up with them and uh, I met also with uh, Russell Brown, uh, who was working, it's still working at Adobe and, and very famous. Uh, if you are into Photoshop, uh, check the Instagram, uh, you see Dr. Brown doing amazing things uh, still today. But in any case, uh, we talked about it and uh, they told me that they were uh, launching Illustrator and this was 1988, they were launching Illustrator in Las Vegas in this big convention. So a magic Comic-Con for, for nerds of the engineering kind, although these days it's all the same thing. Um, and um, well, it would be great uh, to use Illustrator and create a deck of cards. And could I design a deck of cards for them using Illustrator? And uh, I said, well, that's a, that's a great idea. But um, I don't think it's a great idea for me to design the whole deck. The beautiful thing about a deck of cards is you have four different suits. Uh, they had a small team of designers at the time. And I said, how about each of us design a different suit? And that way you can start showing the world that using the software is not going to make us all look the same and we can still have our own individual style, our own individual approach uh, to how we design this um, intact. Uh, we are just using this new tool in the same way that a pen didn't make all of designers exactly the same or a ruler didn't make all engineers the same, right? So uh, that's what we did. Uh, we divided uh, the project into four um, and ended up being this wonderful, uh, in many ways, um, example of how you can use the software to create completely different things. We all had very different styles. We used the software really differently. And um, when uh, the deck was produced and brought into Condex, it became, you know, like everybody wanted this, like hot potatoes. And suddenly, uh, designers started looking at this uh, slightly differently. However, there was still a big barrier to entry because in those days you did not work with Illustrator the way you work today. Illustrator only is existed in outline mode, meaning you didn't see colors, you didn't see thickness of lines. All of it was just thin lines and you had to imagine what it looked like, which I think for me was a great lesson in being able to see things one way and imagine them a different way, right? But today it's a lot more user-friendly, but in those days it wasn't. So when the project finished, they asked me to come in and work with them uh, at this new product that they were not sure if they were going to acquire, this new product called Photoshop. 
and I started working on Photoshop uh, again together with engineers because we were trying to figure out what uh, you know my I think the sentence I said the most was, this is not a bug, this is a feature, please keep it, we like this. Um, and so we were walk, working with pre, pre, pre alpha uh, to create uh, actually guides, um, you know, to work with the software. So we were work, working with buggy software, we were working with, we had to, you know, do our own printing. So we were learning a lot about how to do post script printing, how to do color separations, all of those things. And one of the things that came to my mind once we had these manuals in hand was that it was still very much written the way that manuals were written. You had a uh, user guide that was by theme, right? So you have this menu, and this menu you have all of those different things, and they go each each of them in order, and then this have the other menu, and you have these things, and you go in order. And one of the things I was saying is that that's not how designers work. That's not how designers think. You think about, I have to design a poster, or I have to design a postcard, or I have to design a CD cover or something. And how do I do that? Uh, I don't care where this thing is in the menu. I want to know where are the tools that I need to use. So the idea I had was to create an additional little book that would come together with a whole package it was called Beyond the Basics. And that book was a series of projects in which, I mean, we made up the projects and uh, then you had step-by-step -step which tools you used. And at the end, if you did all of those steps, you had that project. And I thought that that would be a better way for people to uh, use the software and get to learn the software. And that was the beginning of the Adobe Press, a uh, beginning of creating all of these tips and tricks and all of the magazines at the time is by thinking a little bit differently, right? So again, to your theme here, uh, I think that in throughout my career, I've been asked to by circumstance and also by my own curiosity to think again about something that don't just go the way that it's always been done. You need to maybe go back uh, and see at what point ideas split and went in this direction and maybe you can explore going into the other direction and maybe you're gonna find things that are worthwhile. Uh, th this is uh, some very exciting work from some very exciting times, Ruth. Yeah. So, yeah. So for your last question, something that everyone would like to know, looking at your illustrious career as a designer, yeah. is what advice would you like to give to someone who is ready to work towards having a career like yours? Well, I think, you know, these days, I, I think that the more we are being asked, and it's a little bit of a dichotomy, I understand. On one hand, I really advocate uh, being a generalist, at least in the sense that uh, have a, could be shallow, but a really uh, broad understanding of all of the industries around your area of interest. Right. So, for example, if you are a scientist and you are a brilliant scientist and uh, you can be on the lab and you can create these great experiments, but at some point you need to communicate your ideas to somebody else. Right. If you're only able to communicate to somebody who thinks exactly like you, who knows exactly what you want, you're not going to go very far particularly if you are uh, inventive and creative and you're creating something new. You need to be able to talk to people that come from really different backgrounds. And I think that that's also really important in the uh, kind of climate we are today, uh, both political and economical and all of those. We need to understand a lot of things around us, 
okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really important regardless whether you do the very, very, from the very, very uh, beginning, if you know that you want to become a fashion designer, that's what you are interested in, and that is your path, and the path is fairly linear, don't close yourself to a any of the other industries in design and see how they work because even within design they're very different uh there are different ways in which things are done and they're very elements different elements that you need to explore understand and be able to talk to but also look outside of your industry or even in the fashion industry get to know who manufactures uh, these uh, garments, right? Uh, know about the economics, know about the politics of it, know about um, the people who actually do the patterns, right? So educate yourself in a way that first and foremost, you can ask the right question. Because I think that even today, I've been doing this for a very long time, I know a lot of things, but there's an enormous amount of things that I don't know. And every single project for me is an opportunity to learn something. And I'm there to learn from the people who are doing something in an area that perhaps I know nothing about, right? So if I come in and I say, I know what's best for you. I've been doing this for a long time, right? I am the best thing since sliced bread. You need to pay me good money and I'm going to tell you what to do. I think you should fire me on the, the spot like right? because instead what you want is a partner who can communicate, who can understand, who can ask the questions and who can tell you, tell me more about this because I know nothing about this. Why is this important to you? right? Is there anything, this is one of the questions I ask all the time, is there any question that I should be asking you that I haven't asked you yet, right? Is there anything else you have to tell me? And I think that this would be the biggest, um, uh, the biggest advice, but I want to add something else to it, which is, again, I always say this, start with curiosity, because without curiosity, you can't learn but the second thing is, if for whatever reason um, you have things happen to you as they happen to me, that circumstances uh, made me take a right turn or a U-turn uh, into my career, into something that at the time it looks like this is the end of the world, right? I've done so much and now I have to start again or I have to start something that I don't know. Uh Think about this. I mean, it, it sucks. It's, it's not the best thing. And uh, people are not going to know the other things that you know. But you're bringing this with you. But come in humble, right? Come in again uh, being willing to learn. These people have a lot to teach you. Even though you might have a lot to teach them in certain areas, they have a lot to teach you. And you never know when that knowledge is going to become incredibly valuable for where it is uh, that you hopefully are going to get to. So whether you start on the path and you keep it for the rest of your life, which for a lot of people is the right thing to do, uh, or like me, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I either chose or I had to uh, move around and do other things. I think that regardless, it's really important to not keep the blinders on and uh, be able to talk to people and uh, respect the people that you are talking to, learn from them, and use that uh, in order to create something that is usable, it's practical, hopefully it is beautiful and inspiring and new, and it will lead to other great things. I'm, thank you, Ruth. Uh, I'm sure that was very insightful for, for our audience. And we hate, to, we hate to end, Ruth, but that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining us here today. It was a delight hosting you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you all in the audience.
for in these extraordinary times to choosing to spend some time with us. I hope there was something useful for you. And if not, I hope you got a glimpse of my cat going in and out. So maybe that was entertaining. I wish you all the best, safe and healthy. And uh, let's use this time to uh, give creativity a little bit of a boost. And uh, let's get to better time. Thank you again for having me. And with that, we end the third talk of Think Again Live. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.